In this episode, a beautiful boar makes this worth doing. Hacksaws were used to remove bad wood. A duffel cut on a 1903? Who knew? I am the carbon-based life form and the king of acroglass. Ah, cosmoline is a four-letter word. Steam up those dents. Scrapers make short work of a long task. If I'm wearing gloves, this stuff is pretty nasty. Lots of oil hiding in the stock. Where'd all the mung go? This 88 Gewehr and this 1903 Springfield have something in common. They both looked like this. This one is on its way back. Large chip of wood has been replaced. This thing, let's work on this thing. And we're going to talk about wood this time. The metal on this gun's in great shape. So let's get on down the rabbit hole for what amounts to the king of the duffel cuts. So on the first piece, we're going to cut right back to this line. Now, before you say anything about the fact that I'm cutting this with a hacksaw, the reason why I'm cutting with a hacksaw is I want to minimize all that split out that you get. I don't care about how fast, I don't care about how accurate. And I've started the cut in front of this absolute line here, back here where the band rests. Here, let me contrast that There you go. I started the cut up in front because I want to then take uh, rasps and uh, a couple of very very sharp chisels and then go ahead and be able to finish this off plus if I get if I guess this wrong and I migrate over I migrate over on the back side of that somewhere down around the bottom I don't want to have to pay the penalty for that so I'm gonna leave myself lots of room for oopsie daisies Now we've got some sawdust for later when we're going to be filling in uh, nicks and dents in the wood. And it's just nice to have this one. Collect a little bit more when we do the other one. Okay. So we're close here. Let's take a look at how you see. I left a little bit of a step. So the width of the curve is going to be opening up in opposite directions. And we want to leave a little bit too much going that way and a little bit too much going that way. And then milk them together until we get the exact length we want. On a true duffel cut, you do not have that luxury because that little, um, that extra width that you really want to have on a duffel cut is laying on this piece of paper. Now I'm going to stop here because when this cut breaks out into the barrel channel, this will go and we'll get a huge crack right down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll this over and come at it from the other direction. I've collected more than enough sawdust, so I'm not really worrying about that anymore. Give it a good pop there. There we go. Okay, and we're just going to slide this up here and sit on that. So now we've got a front end that's too long. I'm sorry, a rear end that's too long and a front end that's too long. All right. So now we'll start milking off this excess right here till we get back to a nice clean square line. And then we'll milk this excess off until we get back to a nice clean square line. And then when we plug the two together, viola, we've got a stock that's exactly the right length. I'm at a point right here now where I've rasped down and I'm going to show you a little trick that I got shown a long time ago by a guy that's a hell of a lot older than I am is 
we're going to come in and lay the edge of this chisel up against the back of this and just roll it. And this will result in a stop cut that as we're going and as this stuff starts flaking off, it'll flake off into this stop cut and then it won't uh, get all over. We won't ruin everything here. So all I'm doing is taking a very sharp chisel, laying it up against the edge and just rolling it right down into that corner. And then that keeps everything from just flaking off at an inopportune time. The whole purpose of doing this, of course, is to leave one more O3 stock in the uh, gene pool. Instead of throwing both of these stocks out, if you have a fully equipped shop, and really honestly, the guts to do it, let me just go ahead and do that. Okay, so now that we've got that, we can come in and aggressively milk some of this off and not worry about these flex carrying back over. Okay. Now you would ask, why don't we just lay the saw in and make that cut in the first place? You don't have that kind of control with that saw. You don't. A piece of grain grabs it and it takes off. I think it's better to just milk your way up on it nice and slow and get exactly what you want. And it doesn't really matter if this cut doesn't come out exactly perpendicular to the long axis because the glue's gonna take all that up. We're gonna drill a bunch of holes in it anyway. <laughs> Now, did you see all that flake off right there to that line? That's our stop cut right there on the end of my, end of my fingernail right there. That's our stop cut. So when that flaked off, it didn't hurt us. We're getting real close and we're getting real close we're right up on our stop cut right here so now we'll attack from this angle with less aggression all right so now we've got this four end piece taken right to the back end of the stop cut. So the, the locking piece would go in there like that. And then the barrel band is gonna sit on here like this. And we can see now that we're absolutely flush here. And that's the way that side should go. And then we'll make the other side of this cut ever so slightly shorter so that there's just not enough room in between this end of the barrel, lock, barrel band lock and the back end, the part that it's gonna butt up against. And then we can just ever so slightly milk this joint open and make this band real tight. And that's what we're hunting for. So now we're standing, we're standing wood to wood. Here, let me get the light up in there, right there. We're standing wood to wood, end on. The band is tight. The barrel's not in there, but the band is tight. We're end on, we got all the distance right. And when we're done with this, you won't even know we did it unless you got the barrel out of the stock. And that's the whole point. Um, we got to drill, uh, drill for some reinforcements here. So let's get on with that. We'll grab a drill motor. And we'll drill a pilot hole here. So the question becomes, where do you put this reinforcement? Do you put it up high so that when you try to bend the stock this way, that rod's under tension? Do you put it down low, let the barrel reinforce the top, and this reinforce is going up? I'm going to split the difference drill right in the damn middle because we don't have any cleaning rod here. And 
Now we broke out into the into the lightning channel down here. That's fine. That's what we need. So then we need to have a ball like a BB. It's not like a steel ball there. Line this up in the front, right here across the top. And then we're just gonna sit down on this. And that's gonna give us a dent right there. And that's gonna tell us right there, that dent is gonna tell us just about where we wanna go ahead and uh, drill this next hole. Let's we'll drill this. Where's the dent? Right uh, there it is right there. I'll make sure we're close. And we're right on the money. That was actually a viewer showed me that little tip. I'd never seen that done. One of the guys in the comment section said, hey, why don't you just drop a BB on it and give it a smack? Well, there you go. That'll give us a good bite there. We'll glue that end, but you thread that end. And then the other end, we're gonna overbore just a little bit. We'll walk it open a little, just fit. We want this open down in here. We want it open in here, because we want this thread to stick out and the glue to kind of hang onto it like a great big rivet. Here you go. See, that's gonna be perfect right there. And there it is, man. That's that's a, basically a duffel cut on a 1903. That is not something you get to see every day. Right, so it's sticking out in there and it'll hang on to that and we'll smooth it all over and make it look pretty. All right, so we're all done prepping the ends of this. We got our two through holes for a quarter 20 mount. These are just dimples that I just shot in and I'll fill those in full of glue and it'll give the bite and give the, the joint a little bit of torsion. There is a glue escape hole right here. This is air escape because I want to shove glue down the long axis of this so that that, uh, that rod has a complete amount of bite. While I was prepping this, um, I, I wire wheeled that stud down shiny. This spacer will maintain the clearance between the barrel and an O3. These O3s have a tremendous amount of clearance inside. And basically the barrel touches up here at the end and all the way back at the receiver and there's nothing in the middle. So this will keep the entire glue joint from kind of, kind of running uphill. And put the nose metal on. And with the nose metal on and the rear end of this receiver tacked down, this thing is in exactly the right spot and it can't go anywhere. And that it will sit until it hardens. Now, we, we've got a saddle here that we'll probably cut back out of this because we got a nice, clean, oil-free joint. 
and we'll, we'll come back in and file this saddle out later. Don't forget your mold release. This barrel was double mold released because it's still got the lathe marks on it. And boy, you get that thing acroglassed hard and you are in a world of hurt. Do not rub off this squeeze out right here. Don't rub this out because as long as this hasn't wetted the back wood, we'll be able to just knock that out with a chisel. All right. Well, while this is setting, we got another little issue we got to deal with. So let me get some heat on this pig and I'll be right back. Yeah, zooks. However, underneath all of this spooge, oh, gotta love that creamy cosmoline goodness, right? Underneath all of that are two metal clips that are not rusted. So how do we go about getting rid of all this? Well, we can scrape it off the old fashioned way and I'm inclined to do that. And you go, yeah, but what about all of the grease and oil in this cosmoline that is soaked into this wood? And I would tell you that this color is damn near the color I'm shooting for in the wood. We're gonna scrub this down, maybe hit it with a shot of carb, carb cleaner, and then we're gonna have our four in back. And I think we're gonna be okay. One thing I'm not going to do is shoot a video on how to remove cosmoline because I hate it. It's nasty. I have the same affection for it that everyone else has. Well, that's better. I'm going to admit to having a five gallon jug of lacquer thinner, but you don't need a five gallon jug of it to do this. This is just lacquer thinner like you get at Lowe's and you run it on, run it off real quick and it takes that cosmoline right off. And it leaves you with a piece of mountable wood. And, and I'm, I'm just telling you, this is a Sarko. I think this is military new old stock. I have no way to prove it. But what I'll tell you is, these guns did not come with 320 grit sanded finishes. They did not come with eight coats of French polished uh, oil on them. They came, I, I'm, this is from my research that I'm seeing, they were sanded out about this way dipped in a freaking bucket of boiled linseed oil, left to drip dry, put in a box and mailed. And that's about it. So, you know, if you see one of these guns and they're sanded down smooth and you can't see the pores, uh, you got to suspect whether or not maybe one of them went over or not. Um, unless it's anything Swiss. Those guys just over finished the crap out of everything. Anyway, I digress. One of the best ways to not screw this thing up and prepare it for mounting on a gun is to not screw it up. So we're not gonna hit this with any sandpaper. We're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna leave this alone for right now. We will make decisions on stain. Um, the parent gun is pretty nasty. So we're gonna probably go with a really dark red and we'll get it all to match because the parent gun has got some issues. Here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. There it is right there, sitting underneath that lamp. And that lamp is actually heating the barrel up in order to be able to set the epoxy a little bit faster. So that's cool. So we're back here and I get asked, I got asked some finish questions about, hey, the Danish oil you use um, isn't waterproof like tongue oil is. I got news, news for you. There is no such thing as a waterproof finish. You might try to be minimizing the ingress of, of raw water in and out, but water comes and goes out of these things and most finishes are like a wet sweat sock and it just lets it come and lets it go, makes the wood a little bit harder, makes it withstand day-to-day -day handling. But at the end of the day, there is no such thing as a totally waterproof finish unless you're in one of those West system epoxies that make it look like it's sitting under about a quarter of an inch of water. The issue there is the wood then moves and you get all those little cracks like you get on the brownings with all that urethane. Oil is nice because it can be fixed. You can dent it, you can fix it. Um, if you craze it because you're steaming up dents, that's great. All right, I spared you guys all that cleanup out here. When we did the Arisaka, I showed you the dirty part about doing uh, this front thing. We drove this barrel bend on, snapped over, 
And as you can see, we had to make a little bit of, we made a bit of a fit. You can't see it, but I, I came about a 16th of an inch back to make up for the fact that I made the stock a little bit shorter to make this joint tight here. All right, so we're focused up here because what I want to show you is, is this is what this freaking handguard looked like when the gun was new and the stock down here, here, this is where we're at. So this is the actual contrast, how far gone this stock went. While we're here, there's one other thing I want to point out. This cross bolt, you see that pit right there? That's not a pit, that's a stake. This cross bolt has absolutely, there's someone telling us we are not taking the cross bolts out of this stock and we're not gonna do it, I'm not gonna drill it, we're not gonna do squat. We'll do our best to clean that up. But what we'd like to do is make the stock look like this new old stock handguard. Uh, by the way, a lot of that dirt that you see, here, let me get this lit right. See how beautiful that is? Watch this. I can just take my thumb and rub it on that, and it'll turn a full shade darker just from the gack on the end of my thumb. So the, the color of stuff is absolutely, I don't know, ethereal here. A little bit of carb cleaner. Actually, this is brake cleaner, not carb cleaner. Do not use carburetor cleaner, use brake cleaner. Carburetor cleaner has oil in it, and I don't want you to use that. Use brake cleaner if you're ever gonna do it. Basically, it's non-chlorinated brake cleaner is essentially pressurized acetone in a can, and you pay for the convenience. All right, we're gonna get this thing in a place where we can work on all this. We're gonna come in and steam all these dents up, and a lot of these are abrasions. We're gonna do it with the gun put together because I wanna maintain a sense of balance. Don't work here, work here, work here, work here without pulling back. You wanna work here, work over here, work over here and get the whole thing in a sense of harmony. Don't go after one spot, then all of a sudden you got a beautiful spot and it's a divot and the fireman across the street can see it, holy crap. There are some debates about whether or not you steam before you scrape, you scrape before you steam. I don't know, but in this particular case, this stuff is so jacked up in here. Now this almost looks like the gun got dropped on the floor. So steaming isn't gonna do a whole lot of good in here, but we're gonna do it anyway, only because I wanna try for what I can, and I don't wanna cut down to the bottom of it. So again, with the monocoat iron and the steam, um, and I will reiterate here because there will be people watching this video that didn't watch us do a little bit of work on a 98 Mauser. If you're going to put steam on a stock, you have committed to at least partially refinishing it. And I want to make sure everybody understands that. There's a lot of oil in this stock. It, uh, it smells funny. Um, we had some uh, uh, comments and some discussions about killing mold in stocks. Sodium carbonate. Arm & Hammer makes a beautiful super sudsy product. It's not sodium bicarbonate. It is not baking soda. It's carbonate. And uh, that's really, really, really good at killing mold from what I'm told by a bunch of people that know a hell of a lot more about it than I do. Okay. That is starting to lift that a little bit. And I'm trying to look up in here in a monitor and see if you can see that starting to come alive there. And we'll go after every freaking dent in this stock. You see all the water vapor on the surface there. I'm using the edge of this because there's a lot more uh, water in the edges and you can aim it better. You can sneak up on it and aim it. We're getting to the point of diminishing returns here. Um, there's, you know, there is a limit to what you can lift and we're gonna sand down a little bit, scrape down. Actually, I'd love to be able to get through this whole stock and never pull a piece of sandpaper out. And I did it on that 98 stock and I'll do it here, I think. Um, um, once again, one of the real reasons why we're doing all this and we're spending all this effort on this gun is because we, um, we're really trying to keep this stock in the gene pool. Okay, I moved the camera here because I've got the gun jigged right where I want it. I got the muzzle trapped in the vise and I've got the butt laying on the bench. So it's very stable while I work on this. Um, I have a uh, Gewehr 88 that's actually mounted on a checkering cradle to have this other thing done to it because I'm trying to make a point here. 
and I was showing Devin how to hang on to a how to hang on to a stock and we got the long cradle out that thing's seven feet long okay yeah that one's lifting pretty well guys this steam is hot so be careful where you grab the rag and that's personal experience okay be careful where you grab the rag also remember that this stock this this metal is cold and we're actually depositing water vapor on this metal so when we're all done this metal's got to come back out of this stock to make sure it just doesn't sit here and turn right back around and start rusting again. Uh, there was a discussion about whether or not we're going to reparkerize this. I don't think so because um, th this particular metal has got to look like it's been in a stock that looks like it's been drugged through a war. So you got to make it correct. It's got to match. So we've steamed up most of this now, and we're going to switch over to the uh, scrapers here in just a second. Let's see what we got here. Because I'd like to get a lot of this lifted off the surface and take a look at it. Okay, we'll put that over there. So we're going to take a hot air gun here. Pardon me while I reach in front. Oop, bump the camera. And I'm just drying the gratuitous water out of this. You don't want to get it too hot because then I don't want all the oil to come floating up to the surface. We've talked about scrapers in the past, how they're sharpened um, and how they're employed and how you raise the edge on them. Uh, go back and review that. We had a quite, quite a thing about it. All right, let me hang this up. See this grain's kind of running uphill like this? That tells me that the scraper's probably going to be happier cutting this way than it will be cutting this way, but it all depends. You cut the way the wood likes you. It's kind of like petting a cat backwards. You've got to make sure that you always pet the cat in a way that it doesn't completely object to your attempts. One of the things I like about scrapers is, let's assume that this cut right here through the stock, let's assume that that was a cartouche, that that was put in there. Somebody knocked on the end of this and put that in. You'll notice we have not cut that away. We've skated right over the top of it. Scrapers are far more discriminant than not screwing up stampings than sandpaper is. And sandpaper, even back sandpaper, would ride down into this hole and back out again and muddy this whole thing up. So now that we've got this, we've got this scraped here, let's go back in and steam a little bit more. So now that we've done that, let's go back and really hit this again because we've cut the wood off the top now. So now we can really see what we're doing. I'm having a sudden urge for a cigar. All right, that picked that up a lot more. We're going to keep steaming here. All right. Okay.
All right, so as you can see here, now we've come to a second level of Wet is a little bit more, and we're almost we're bringing that crack up to the surface so that we did not have to remove all sorts of extraneous crap around it. I'm sorry, I'm reaching in front. Hang on a second here. Okay, that dent is damn near all the way gone. I mean, it doesn't even have any depth. Now this is damaged. So this damage goes down a little bit further than I want to go because we are bumping precipitously up against, hang on a minute, there's going to be a little shot of air here. We are bumping precipitously up against running into this recess here and I don't want to bump down there. So we'll probably leave that and continue on. And the rest of the stock is going to be scraped, steamed, scraped, bumped up and we're going to try to get this whole gun done without any uh, sandpaper if we can get away with it. We've uh, immersed this in um, lacquer thinner for about well one minute per decade so in this particular case about eight to ten minutes we've immersed this and you can do this without five gallons of lacquer thinner by soaking a rag in that stuff and, and wrapping the stock in it for a, a little while, 10, 20 minutes. And then when you take the rag off, make sure you put the rag somewhere and let all that volatile stuff pop out of it. Um, so we did that and we removed a lot of, a lot of the oil in this stock. And you can see it's cutting much easier, much more freely. Lacquer thinner and chemicals are not everyone's cup of tea, but I will reemphasize that if you use caustics or you use a petrochemical, whatever you use on a stock, once you use it, you have committed to refinish the whole thing. Now there are some numbers here and we haven't been able to read them yet. We don't know. There was a stamp here and this was messed up. It's not the serial number of the gun. We know that for a fact. Um, and we, we know, we, we don't know if it's a rack number. We don't know what it is. So I'm trying, I mean, really, really gentle and I'm not cutting through it, but you're not going to be able to read it. Because this particular stock has been through, been through grief. Don't come all the way to the end. We don't want to round this off. We don't want to get, we don't want to roll this out. So I'm coming right up to the edge and when we go to do the final finish, we'll go ahead and throw the butt plate on this thing and make sure we don't override it. But you can see here, No sandpaper, and that's coming out nice. Now the numbers that we're trying to avoid are here and here. You don't want to steam these numbers or else, I mean, they're impressions. You'll pop them up. So you don't want to steam the impressions. But once you get all that oil and stuff out of the stock, it's far easier to go ahead and scrape it that way. That dent disappeared. Everything disappeared here. There's some crosswise abrasions that almost look like this thing's been filed on with a rasp. I don't know what happened to this thing, but I can tell you that this is a lot nicer looking chunk of wood than it was when we started. We'll keep going. There's a very, very large hunk out of the bottom of the stock. I'm gonna show you how to deal with that. In the center of the screen here, there's a very large, chunk of wood lifted and I've got this kind of cross lit so you can see it right on the umbra. There it is. There's a dig. There's a dig. So there it is right across the top. You're not going to be able to put that back. That's not going to steam out. That can, however, with an extremely sharp chisel, just be rolled off like this and just get down below the surface. What we don't want to do is create an enormous divot here. We just want to cut it off. It is what it is. So we'll just roll this off. 
right there like that. There is some writing right here. There's a Papa Charlie right there. I'm trying to avoid digging down into that because those are desirable markings that we would like to leave behind. But this can just be rolled off very gently. Use the slicing action. See how I'm pushing the blade sideways? And we're going to come in and reverse, come from the other side and just knock this stuff off here. There we go. It's digging. Okay. So that was it. We did not have a choice. It's sticking up like that. We got to slice it off. And now it just looks like a large, large divot. Again, we're back to, we're back to our, basically a single edged file is what the scraper is. And we can come over this Papa Charlie without losing it, you see. What I've done now is tighten this up. You can see him even better. That's as far down as I'm going over these letters. But we did get the surface layer of mung off of it. Be careful when you're up in here. Because what you don't want to do is dig this down. You don't want to dig down. So be very, very careful of all your edges. Just be careful of your edges. There's... Um, you know, anytime you're near the edge of an inlet or something crazy, you're going to get into that. So there's all of these, there's all of these digs everywhere. And we just got to kind of go in and cut them off because you're not going to iron them down. You're just going to have to just get them off. This thing looks like it was drugged behind a kid's bicycle. The stock has had a hard way to go. I'm just coming in and slicing this. Ridiculously sharp chisels really help here. Okay. Cut that off. Cut this. Right there. Guys, it's just like when you're shaving and you're feeling for the whiskers. It's right there. Girls, I have no analog for you. Just, if it, if it feels rough, just cut it off. I don't know what else to tell you about that. Then we're back in with the steam. It's a big old cut running right here. Let's see if we can at least lift some of that cut up to where we can get to it. The important point to note here is that all of this takes time and time is money. So if you have a lot of time to throw at something, you can throw it at this. But if you're wondering why your local gunsmith is looking at you like you're a little bit nuts because he wants you to, I got this here $75 mill syrup and I was wondering for $50 if you can make it look like it's brand new again. Not going to happen, guys. You're going to have to do this yourselves. Okay, a little bit more right there. You're going to have to do this yourself. Okay, so we lifted that. That one's pretty much gone. This guy right here. That's pretty much gone too. We're going to drop a lot of steam right there. Okay. Yeah, you see, you just slowly but surely work your way around the stock and go after all of this nastiness and eventually it'll start looking decent. You do not need an industrial grade hot air gun. You can use a hair dryer for this. You can just use a regular old hair dryer. Uh, you don't have to have, I just happen to have that heat gun because I use it for other things. So, you know, all this will just shave down nice and easy. Okay, 
A sharp scraper is giving you that real, real fine curl right there. There you go. So we have a rag that's been saturated in lacquer thinner here, and we're going to go after this oil up to this barrel band. Now this lacquer thinner, I'm going to tell you what, I'm not famous for wearing gloves or doing things, and even I'm wearing gloves here because this stuff will make a third hoo-hoo grow out of your forehead. However, comma, it's doing a really, really good job of taking years and years of cosmoline out of this. Plus this stock was uh, exposed to some heat and that heat did a pretty good job of cooking that cosmoline into this wood. So we'll just give it a good scratch there and we'll let it. So, so far, we're pretty much done in the back, back here. We're coming around a corner. There's a lot of nicks and pops. Uh, most of the things here now have got to be steamed a little bit. I've got my steaming iron heating, heating up and we'll continue to work our way all the way forward on this and get it pretty well ironed out. We are going to take some sandpaper to this particular stock just because I want to talk about sandpaper. It doesn't really need it, but you know, how do you go from this rough um, this level of roughness over to something that's smooth, but not molested. Okay, we'll do that. And we're going to come up forward here. All right, we want to be, oop, I wanted that upside down. Now front here, again, a lot of heat got put on this stock. So we just want to get any of the remaining oils off of it. For those of you guys just doing one of these rifles at home, you have the luxury of time. Budget about, I don't know, a week of spare time. So if your idea of spare time is two or three days on a, two or three hours on a Saturday, just know it's gonna take you about a month to get through one of these. Don't be in a hurry, because they're not making any more of them. There's a theory we were bantering about in the shop yesterday about whether or not the lacquer thinner would make it easier to reinflate the wood pores. Bruno's operative theory and the one I'm going to run with is that by removing the oil, the water now has access and can reinflate the cellulose part of the wood fibers in this and blow this all back up. Outstanding. So Bruno and I were playing around with ways to show the inside of a bore and it requires us to pull the focus in and out. And there it is. And that's what this thing ought to look like. Shiny to the bottom. Uh, I had to scrub this one a little bit, but it wasn't rusted. This particular bore had that cosmoline that had been burned look to it. Um, but remember that cosmoline, rust, pits, gilding metal, and lead are all bore obstructions as well as the obvious sticking the muzzle in the mud. You need to be able to see all the way down your bore. You need to keep them clean and you buy the bore on an old gun and we can fix the rest of it. If you had just started in on this stock with straight up sandpaper, all your sandpaper would have been gunked up, it would have been a nasty mess and you would not have made a lot of headway and you would have gone through an enormous amount of sandpaper.
That's better. So that's better when, than it was when I started. Just knocking everything off and not being too uh, aggressive. The whole point is to get this whole stock down to about the same state and then get out before anybody knows you were in here. We're getting close. We've got most of this buffed out and then just keep working the stock down till you get all the way done with the scrapers. Let's talk about sandpaper next because that's a topic that's going to have to come up. Okay, we began with a stock that looked like this. This is what this thing looked like and it wound up here. And the reason why we took all this time to get everything off is because if you start with this sandpaper right here and you try to sand this off, all it's going to do is clog the sandpaper. It's just going to clog it. It's not going to do anything and you will go through piles of sandpaper attempting to sand this stuff off and it gets all gacked up and then it smears it into the wood. You don't want to do that. So pretty much the course of sandpaper I use in a shop is a 150 backed with a felt pad. Um, you can just hang on to it like this. This is going to be good enough for what we're going to do here. And we're just going to cut anything that's sticking up down off the surface. There's a tendency to over sand these stocks. You know, people go to 400, 500, 600, much below about 300 grit. All you're doing is polishing this wood. You're not really sanding anything. And we still have some adherence. I'm going to wipe that on my PC. We're still... We've got some oil in here that's making this stick, and we're not going to be able to get below it, but um, boy, I tell you what, this sure beats the heck out of trying to cut all of this nastiness off of this piece of wood with just sandpaper. And the only way to really get it off the wood with sandpaper is to start in the 40 to 60 grit range and just, you know, gnarl it all off. Well, why not just use a, uh, why not use a rasp or a scraper to uh, take it off? Um, I think it's easier and uses a lot less materials. The difference between an amateur and a pro is that an amateur will expend time to save materials and the pros are expending materials to save time. But there is a limit to that. Okay. So we'll sand this. And once we get, I'm not going to go through this whole stock. We're just standing with sanding down one piece, one piece of walnut here. 
and we get this wet and this is pretty much what it's going to look like if we use the natural stain we're going to go red this gun's going to look a lot better with a red okay so we have a fairly deep dark piece here let me grab a little bit of light here and you can see what i'm talking about it's fairly dark here because this is where all the oil from this ferrule penetrated and i'm not going to be able to cut down far enough so we're going to we're going to leave that and then if there is a way i can show it you see how this it almost looks like razor stubble standing up on the ends and that has to be cut off So I've cut that off, and you can see the difference between where it's stubbled out over here, let me come around a corner, right there, and where I just sanded it off. Now that we've sanded that off, if you get it wet again, it'll stand back up. So let's go ahead and dryer that. And it stood back up, but not nearly as bad. So we just continue to repeat that, cut it off. And this, you're doing this on the entire stock. You're cutting this off like this, getting it wet, and you keep going until the grain doesn't stand up. Then you're done. Now granted, we've only done this very small part of the stock, but here it's nice and smooth now. And it's rough, it's rough down here. Uh, I can't turn that, but it's rough kind of, yeah, just a little bit, break that right there, good, stop, tension it up. So it's still rough down here where I didn't sand it, but it is smooth here. And that's what you're trying to get rid of on the entire stock with just a gentle application of water, heat, it stands up. Now, if you don't want this to happen, you would use like alcohol. And this is why I'm gonna use an alcohol-based stain so we don't get any of this inadvertent stand-up. Where this will really start driving you nuts is when you're checkering and when you're uh, carving, which is why religiously sharp tools are always a help. Once we've got that dryered off, we can go down to 220 on this. We can get down to a 220 grit, but you're almost wasting your time on a military weapon. You just don't win any obvious cross grain scratches. Um, and the pores don't even have to be filled. You just need to get all of the razor stubble off of it, all of the standing up grain. We're done sanding this, and there is a point of diminishing returns. There's some damage here to the wood. There's a cut we didn't get through here. There's a, a kind of a rough spot here, but to get into that is gonna leave a pit about the diameter of my fingernail, and I don't wanna go in there. There's a point of diminishing returns on all of these guns because the metal isn't new, and it looks like it isn't new, so there's a limit. Even with steaming and cutting and sanding, you can see various pieces of sandpaper that I've used that have loaded up full of the oil that's seeping out of this stock. And that is after the lacquer thinner steaming scraping treatment. There's still a lot of oil in this stock. And to get this thing all the way down and make it not look nice and pretty, you're not really gonna be proving anything to get down that far. It, it just won't look right. However, I think we pretty much got it from where it was. This is the point on a regular gun where if you wanted to fill in all of these pores, you wanted to fill in all of this open grain here, that's what that card full of sawdust was for right back there. The card full of sawdust, you'd smear it on the finish as you're, as you're sanding in and it helps to fill all the pores. It's, it's always good to have a little bit of sawdust left over. We're not doing that here because it's, uh, it's lipstick on the peg. This is what this is. So stains, a lot of these earlier um, O3s, the Garens had kind of a reddish stain and I'm gonna go dark. If you wanna see what a gun's gonna look like blonde, just get it wet like I did on that 94 reveal. You get it wet, that's the color it would be right there if we just put any kind of oil, linseed oil or, um, or in my particular case, a Danish oil. 
Um, that's the color it would be. And that's not nearly dark enough. I want to take it down dark enough to hide this entire plethora of issues. And the other deal is, is that as stock finishes age, they get darker. Our preferred mode of application is going to be a 55 cent chip brush. Just go buy these things. Don't try to save them. They're not worth saving. I have a, a um, just a, a stain that I've been using. It's an antique walnut stain, but they're all spirit stains. They're all, this is a Vanderhave Formula 13. Pick this up from Brown Owls. Um, and in case you were curious, here we go. So I want just a little bit of red in this, and it's gonna be this arbitrary here. We're just gonna put a little bit of the red in there because I'd like a reddish hue to it. And I want this darker than any stain I can get, so I'm gonna throw a little bit of the dark stuff in it. Just a little bit. Now I'm doing two guns with this. I've got a Gavar 88 over there that we're working on. And the Gavar 88 is gonna get the same treatment, so I'm gonna use the same oil for both stocks. And then you don't need a whole lot of this stuff. You just need enough of it to get the brush wet, and that's it. That's gonna do this whole gun. So, we're gonna do the bubble bubble boil and trouble routine here. Just kind of mix it all up. And uh, well, let me get up here. It's, uh, it's moment of truth time, boys and girls. Oh yeah. Now don't worry about it getting it on the metal. And I left the metal on the gun because I wanted A, the structural stability of the whole gun being bolted in one piece. And two, it made me not sand in areas where wear doesn't occur. You can't get the sandpaper in there, your hands didn't get in there. So the, the gun's not flawlessly finished all the way to the bottom. But uh, yeah, that's some good looking stuff. We'll keep going on this. We'll, uh, we'll paint the fore end here. Let's see here, we'll keep going. Now you're not, this is not a coat you're putting on. This is an application. Meaning we're gonna leave it on and let it soak in and keep reapplying in areas where it's soaking in. Um, and then we're gonna leave it on for about 20 minutes and wipe it off. And then let it set for an hour or two and then come back in with another application and keep going until the wood's pretty much done drinking it. And then we're gonna wax this one. I think we're gonna wax this stock cause it's gonna need it for the way it's gonna get run. And I tell you what, I don't think that's looking too bad right there. Yeah, that's looking good. So we'll keep going with this. I have to rejig it in a vice and I'll go, but I'm putting it on with a paintbrush. You guys have seen me dab, think, dab things on with my fingers. And when I'm doing small applications, yeah, but when you do the whole thing. And then overnight, you take this lid and you just, uh, you just cut a notch in the lid like this. Sorry, and then like that. And then overnight, you can cap this bucket like this and that brush and that oil will keep for several days and allow you to keep coming back in here, applying more if you wish, go, go, go. On a military weapon, you only had basically one pass of this stuff, maybe two. Now I'm wiping it down prematurely, but I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen here when you wipe it down. The areas that had never had any finish on them at all are kind of flat. There we go. These are kind of flat. This down here is gonna have a little bit more sheen to it because the, the wood has had oil oxidized in it before. But this is essentially what you're after. I'm gonna go ahead and goop this back down. This is kind of what we've gone through. We started here, we progressed to here. And now we're at a place that has final finish on it. There's a coat of oil setting up on this and when I'm all done, we'll wind up waxing this thing. You can still see uh, imprints and insignias anywhere that there was any kind of information in this, in this stock, we have it. We've taken most of the scrot off. We've gotten the big lines steamed up. That was a deep one. I couldn't go in and get that without a huge dip. We left the cross bolts alone because they weren't eking rust. The metal is decent and um, there's still a few parts missing to this. We can't shoot it today because right now 
The constraints of shooting this video says here it sits with a coat of oil on it that needs to set for another couple hours and then it's got to get waxed and then it's got to get put back together again and we're out of time so I've got to end this video here but you know just to summarize what we covered was how to begin by scraping, filing, raising dents by steaming, carding, using um, uh, scrapers and then finally cutting through to sandpapers and uh, finishes where we oiled it down, uh, stains that I like to use, and then we were into waxes, which is just going to be hot air gun toilet bowl ring all the way down this thing, and it'll be done, and it'll look right, and we started out with a front end off of one, a rear end off another, and we wound up with a complete gun. For complete disclosure, the unit that used to belong to this rear end failed its hardness test and the barrel was bent it was gone it was done so we didn't we we had two rifles one of them is dq'd and out of the gene pool and we took a good piece of its stock and kept this one in the gene pool and that's about the best we can get and it's always been a pleasure to help you guys out you can do this do the maintenance carbon-based life form signing off